Ani nindwe magene dok ni kagwe kitamagas bine sikwe irgo makwendo dam gababani kagish kanigene ngindu jibami which thank you so much for the honor of being here with you today being here on your land your uh, Duwamish people's land and thank you for the honor song and the gift and uh, to the really lovely students that I spent the last day with thank you for your hard work our community was like super excited well as you know we we're kind of like wired in to watch y'all and uh, you know for someone who's never grown marijuana my whole life trying to be a hemp farmer is like really challenging <laughs> I mean like, just to be honest like I went into this guy's field and he had 85,000 female plants and I was like what it's like it was for CBDs, right? Like, why would I know that you had to have 85,000, you know, female plants and that some of the girls try to turn into boys? Like, who would know that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I have to go out and sex my plants every week. I was like, some of the girls are turning into boys. I'm like so out of my league in this industry. So I'm trying my best. I'm a good corn grower. My friend Devon Pena is here too. He's a good corn grower. So it's was, it was an honor to see him and uh, be here with y'all. Um, as I was thinking this morning on beautiful Vashon Island after my fabulous day yesterday where I, like, we walked onto the ferry. You guys do this all the time. I like, you know, there's like an electric car, then I walked on the ferry, and then I got off the ferry and there was a woman with like three kids on the back of an electric bike. <laughs> I was like, and then I got on an electric subway. I was like, oh my God, this is like the next economy. Come to Minnesota anytime. <laughs> So thank you, you know, I was like really, I was so happy to be here and to see everything and, and thank you all for hanging out inside with me on such a beautiful day. So I'll, I'll visit and then let's go back outside because it is great spring, it was a great spring here. As I was reflecting on my notes this morning, I was like, you know, I'm, that, that I'm talking about to be a water protector. That's what I want to talk about, to be a water protector and what that means because, you know, as, as you likely know, many of us, how many of you were at Standing Rock? Some of you were at Standing Rock? Thank you for your service, and for the rest of you who supported us, thank you. Because uh, I am a water protector. I'm a water protector, as I'm sure are all of you. But you know, in the, in the political climate that I face, I do not come from this area. I, I fortunately come from a territory that is between North Dakota and Wisconsin. But there's a lot of hating of water protectors in my territory or, you know, a little bit west of me. And so I'm proud to say that I am and, and uh, you know, I'm going to continue to be that. But as I, as I thought of what I was going to talk about this morning, this, there's the, uh, I, was, I was thinking of um, the film, um, you know, I was talking about unobtainium. Do you remember in the film Avatar where they're talking about unobtainium? And it's like this moment where it's like Windigo economics, unobtainium, and water protectors in the next economy. I sort of feel like where we are because of like in the, in the moments that we are in, you know, it is prophesized in our, in our time, it is, it is referred to as the time of the seventh fire, where we are told as Anishinaabe people we have a choice between two paths. And one path they say is well-worn and it is scorched. And the other path they say is not well-worn and it is green. And we are told that it is our choice upon which path to embark. And I'm really sure that that is where we all are at this moment. You know? And as you look out there in the, in the final stages of the fossil fuels economy and the thrashing of an inefficient, I refer to it as a windigo economy, you know, in the final stages of that where they are running out of things to dig out of the earth and running out of oil and extreme opportunities, they are like so aggressive in their final hours. And it is really incumbent upon us to summon up every bit of courage we have to stand against them and to move to the next economy. And so that's what this is about, is that moment. This is about that and this moment. So I start with this uh, picture here. I don't know if you want to throw a couple of those lights down, but I don't know if you could see this, but this is from Duluth, uh, Minnesota. And I, you'll see here at the end, but this is a water protector. And this woman is, uh, you know, Duluth is one of those cities, you know, where uh, Native women are often, uh, you know, we, we are invisible. And it is a high rate of homelessness, and it is also a high rate of sex trafficking in the Great Lakes, and it is a lot of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so this is a painting by Votan, who is a great artist, a great Indigenous artist out of L.A., and, and he came up and he put this, and this is a, she, this she, she overlooks the city of Duluth, and she is about 60 feet tall and about 40 feet wide. And so we are very visible in Duluth and she is a water protector. And I'm really proud to be part of making her happen. 
And, uh, you know, to me, like, when that happened, it's like, change this moment in Duluth, where I was like, you see us now, don't you, Duluth? Right downtown on 2nd and 2nd, <laughs> if you visit us. So, she is a water protector, and I want to speak in honor of her and the others, too. To be a water protector, and then here's the next one here. Can you just do that next one for me? Someone just gave me this beautiful print here of a sturgeon. Isn't that beautiful? This is Christy Belcourt's artwork. And a sturgeon, you know, is one of the most amazing fish most, most amazing fish. They live about 150 years, you know? And they're like 220 million years. There's some old, old fish in the May. It's like the king, it's kind of like the buffalo of the Anishinaabe. And I often tell this story about in my community, they're wiped out. They're wiped out by, you know, commercial fisheries and dams and just, 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 just like the buffalo, they wiped our guys out. And then here about uh, 15 years ago, no, have to be about 20 years ago, I have to remember my, in my time, the time that I took four Indians in it four children in an Aerostar van across the border <laughs> up to Canada to some ceremonies at Rainy River Reserve. And I went to see my friend Al Hunter, Al Hunter. And he, uh, he said, uh, you know, we went to ceremonies up there in that little reserve. And he said, you should meet my brother. His name is Joe Hunter. Joe Hunter, we refer to him as the Sturgeon General of Canada. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and he has this largest sturgeon fishery, in, sturgeon, you know, hatchery in Canada is on this Rainy River Reserve. So I went to see him and I, and I was like, I was amazed at these fish, you know, I really love these fish, you know, as I knew about them before and I, they're super yummy, everybody here knows that, you know, and uh, I, I got to pet them, you know, they were in there having sturgeon sex and making babies, I don't know how, well, you know what I'm saying, but I got to pet them, they're super docile, you know, and then um, I, come, I said to Joe, I said, can I, can I, can I bring some home? And he said, uh, yeah. So then I come back the next weekend with like, you know, four kids, Aerostar van, one bubbly thing hooked to my, you know, car lighter and a couple of Coleman coolers. And so I go up there and I get five sturgeon, five sturgeon, about four-year-old, five-year-old sturgeon. And I take them and I'm, I say, I, I take them back to my re reservation because it's the same species in this one area, you know, but they've been wiped out of my territory. And so I brought them. I said, well, Joe, what do I do when I hit the border? And he says, oh, oh just say they're your pets. <laughs> so me and my, my five sturgeon and four children return across the border, you know, it's one of my many, we will just be honest about it, I, I don't have a lot of regard for that white man's paperwork there on that border, you know, because Anishinaabe people are on both sides of that border, like many of the indigenous people here. So I come back and I take them home and I put them in my lake, Round Lake, Round Lake. And I, uh, I said, uh, you know, and then a couple days later, I go talk to my tribal fisheries biologist. I just want you to understand the sequence of how this works, right? <laughs> After I go talk to the tribal fisheries biologist, his name is Randy Zortman, and he is like literally wringing his hands when he sees me. And he hears this story. He's like, do you have any idea, Winona, of how many laws you just violated? <laughs> like, the International Transport of Endangered Species. It was like going on. And I said to him, I said, Randy, wait, I think I just lost the mic. See, this is me. Here, coming back. Oh, oh. He said, uh, he said um, you know, and I said, Randy, there's the white man's laws and there's the creator's laws. And the sturgeon knew new borders, you know? And so then, you know, a couple weeks later, I go see this guy named Tim Holtzkamp, who's a fisheries biologist and a historian. And he's kept track of the sturgeon and all the fish in our territory. And he says, you know, funny thing, the tribe was here last week. And so then uh, it turns out that my tribe ha now has the largest sturgeon restoration project in the region. And we have hundreds of thousands of sturgeon, right? So I, you know, I say that, and when my first grandson was born, his clan was sturgeon clan. And I was very proud to say, look, my grandson, look what granny got you. you know? <laughs> but I, I say that because everybody here knows that, you know, we are related to those. Those are our relatives. In Dinaway, Muganatuk, those are our relatives. And so, you know, to me, this is like what a water protector looks like, as mighty as they can be, you know, as old as they can be and as, as regal as they can be, you know. And, and, and I tell the Enbridge Company and all those guys, we did not do that for you to pollute our waters. We did not do that for you to pollute our waters. We brought our, our relatives home. So this is my little sturgeon story. You, next slide, please. Water protectors, this is from uh, Standing Rock, some of our ladies from Standing Rock. Next one here. So this is where I live, Gawawi Egamug. I live on Round Lake in the middle of the reservation, south, uh, southeast corner of the reservation. I just like show you my language a little bit. Gawawi Egamug, 
This month in our language is called Ona Banagesis, which means a hard crusted snow moon. I think you all understand that. Freeze and thaw, freeze again, right? Also known as the moon you don't want to do a face plant in the snow. Iskigami <laughs> Zigigesis, the maple syrupy moon. Then we got uh, Wabagana Gizis, the flower moon, Odamina Gizis, the strawberry moon, Mean Gizis, the blueberry moon, Manominike Gizis, the wild rice making moon. Then we have uh, Watibaga Gizis, when the leaves change color. And then we have a, a moon uh, that uh, Benakweo Gizis, when they fall, Gashkadno Gizis, freezing snow moon, which is like November. I don't know, I just thought you'd like to hear some of my language. You know, it's different from out here, it's Algonquin speakers, about a third of the continent is Algonquin speaking. But saying that, you know, what I'd say is, is that, did you also notice that uh, none of our, uh, those moons, you know how they are, but did you notice that none of them is named after a Roman emperor? <laughs> I'm saying it's possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire, you'll be okay. <laughs> time to go, time to go. Right? It's not useful at this point. I look at those names out there and you don't even want to start. Like that Rainier, who is that guy? <laughs> you know, let us return to the names for places that belong there, for the people who know and the land that belongs there. So you're doing a good start here, so I appreciate that. Just keep it up. Just keep returning things to the name that belongs there for them. So this is, oh, look at that. We started moving. <laughs> this is my people I work for. This is the Thompsons. This is uh, Todd and his, and his father. And um, I'd like to show this picture because this is what wild rice looks like on the lake. And this is what n native people, Ojibwe's, look like when we are harvesting wild rice. Two sticks in a canoe out there. They are, uh, I believe that they're in the refuge. I'm going to say that they're like on Tamarack Lake. Some of our lakes are much larger, but it looks like a field. But that is our monomen. And, and uh, you know, I learned a lot about that. And, you know, I'll say I'm here because of, of wild rice for sure. Some of my parents met. But I also want to say that, you know, in the, in the bigger picture, you know, what a great gift to have, you know, all you got to do is take care of your lake and every year in succession, you know, that wild rice will be there. 10,000 years, we people live there and we harvest the same territory. All you got to do is take care of your lake. You know, I live in a place where you can still drink the water from a lake. My friend Patrick, he's up there from the Boundary Waters Territory, you can drink the water from a lake, you know. You can get this wild rice, you can get sugar from a tree. That's what we're doing right now. We're tapping our trees. You know, you can get fish. Uh, as the Creator gave us many gifts and our covenant and our responsibility is to take care of that which the Creator gave us because the Creator gave us everything that we need. Everything that we need. Now, so this is my territory and this is what we're fighting for up here. Oh, no. Now we're done with that. How great that was. Okay. This is uh, some art from our territory. I just showed you, know, you this, but this is uh, art by his passed away. His name is Ray, Ray Thomas. But this piece is called, uh, we are all in the same boat. <laughs> Which, you know, makes some sense, you know, and I know we all get this, because it is not a matter of, you know, who we are. We are all related. We are relatives, you know, and this is our moment to stand up. But I always like point this art out, because when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to study uh, the art of Europe, you went to the fine arts department. And if you want to study indigenous art, you went to anthropology. And so what is true is that all these institutions, you know, basically they, they kind of pepper a pretty white education with some multiculturalism. And I think we ought to be honest about that. And it's really time that these institutions, whatever they are, begin teaching it, you know, begin expanding that a little bit, more than a little bit. Because I will suggest to you that it is possible that the, that the paradigm that got us into this problem is not going to get us out. You know? You've got to be open. You gotta like figure out who can teach you. You know, I learn from all kinds of people. You know, I learn from all kinds of people. I'm pretty, you know, I'm I'm pretty good. I have to like every day. I have to like kind of hit the reset button because sometimes someone will come to you, you know, come to you and you'll be like kind of like I don't know if I want to talk to that person. They seem kind of like, like a little much for me right now. You know, <laughs> I know y'all been there, right? And then so like one time this German reporter is talking to me like I don't really German reporters are not my thing. You know, <laughs> and he's like super like you know like that. And, and he's, I was listening to him. I mean, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes I get kind of intense, those guys, right? So he's talking, and, he's, and, he, and he, he was talking about imago cells, imago cells. That was so interesting to me. Imago cells are the cells that are, that are uh, you know, in a, they're at first you have the caterpillar and then the pupa, you know what I'm talking about? And the first cells appear, and they're killed off by the organism. And then the next ones come, and the next ones come, and finally the imago cells take it over and turn the caterpillar into a butterfly or a moth. It is the imago cells. 
And the imago cells is the same word and same root as the word for imagination. And so I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that is what we are like. We are like a social movement, and that is what it's like. They first they knock you out, you know, or, or like, my, you know, like my, my sister over here who has arrested a valve turner. You know, they put you in jail. They do that, and they act as if, you know, we are like, well, I mean, they, you know, they act as if they marginalize us. I never call myself an activist, you know. I think I'm a responsible citizen. You know what I'm saying? That's what, that whole thing, you know. They like marginalize you and act as if your ideas are like really far out there. And I'm like, no, your ideas are out there. You know, you guys want to poison the water, you know, and I'm a water protector and you want to arrest me and shoot me because I want to protect the water. You know, it's that whole like, do not let them take that. Do not let them take our, the language or the, you know, your integrity. You know, like, you wish, wish always keep that, keep that. But I think about that because that is what it is like to be a water protector, you know, and all of us. It's like a lot of times, and so we are those imago cells. And we are the ones that are going to need to transform this Windigo economy. We're the ones that are going to need to do that. So let's see what the next slide is. I'm going to be a surprise to me, too. <laughs> you guys don't need a big lecture on this. We have combusted ourselves to the edge of oblivion. <laughs> Y'all got that memo, right? You know, we're all there. This is a Navajo gener you know, this is a Four Corners power plant. Navajo Nation has five coal fire power plants. Uh, four coal strip mines, and Navajo Nation a couple years ago spent uh, pretty much a lot of their general fund egg, their nest egg, on buying a 50-year-old coal strip mine from BHP Billiton, largest mining corporation in the world, so they could keep their mining economy going. That's the Navajos, right? And I'm saying that because 85% of the Navajo economy is based on fossil fuels. And so what I'm saying is like we are all safe facing the same problem. There's like a lot of Kool-Aid, bad Kool-Aid drank, by a lot of people in a lot of communities, and now is this moment where we all got to work to transform this economy in every way we can away from this super energy intensive, super fossil fuels, extractive windigo economy. Next picture. Y'all have been haven't watching Fox News, so you know this, you're aware of this slide, right? You know, temperatures rising. Next one here. Next, next slide, please. This is my territory, what I'm facing, you know, and I was just up in, in Ottawa, Canada, you know, and, and I, anytime they ask me, I go up there, but you know, the reason this slide is still up here is that this is my territory, this is what I'm facing. I'm not only facing the largest damn pipeline that they're trying to cross the border with, but I'm facing all that. And the thing is, is that we all sit here and, you know, I mean, what I want to say is, is that this is Canada's dysfunctional economy. You know, everybody acts like Canada's all cool with that Trudeau and everything. Canada's not cool. <laughs> Canada's not cool. 75% of the world's mining corporations are Canadian. Human rights abuses are, are conducted all over the world by Canadian mining corporations. I mean, we could say Rio Tinto, Zinc, and Bougainville, but we could just talk about all the Canadian corporations who cause civil rights and human rights violations in Central America. Or we could just talk about that all of those are basically Canadian, and the large pipeline projects are all Canadian. You know, that is Canada. That is Canada trying to, and it's an economy that is an example of a Windigo economy or a cannibal economy because they do not have a second plan. I'm just saying, and how you know is like you just go across the border. Do you ever see how cheap the loonie is right now? It's like 75 cents on the dollar. I was just there. And that's because 90% of the value of the loonie is predicated on the value of tar sands. So I'm like, time to grow up, Canada. Time to move on. Trudeau is talking about, they're talking about $6 billion worth of new pipelines and it's going to cost $4 billion to get water into 91 Aboriginal First Nations villages who don't have potable water in them, don't have drinkable water in them. You know, and it's a crisis across this country, across the continent. You've got a D in infrastructure, America. You all know because a Skagit bridge fell apart, right? D in infrastructure. We're looking at billions of dollars of stupid infrastructure projects for oil companies. You know, and a lot of what this is about is this moment where we got to transform an economy which is based on that to an economy where, where we have infrastructure not for pipeline companies and not for multinational corporations, but for people. But for people. And that's really this time and this moment that we're in. Next picture. This is what fracking looks like from the sky. Next picture. This is this oil pipeline. I don't know if this is exactly the right slides, but go next one. This is, okay, and this is all North Dakota. That's the point of this, is that we just had this big battle over Standing Rock. Y'all remember the battle over Standing Rock? So this is what they're trying to justify, is all that fracking, all of that contamination, and in fact, this. You know, this is a picture that was taken up in North Dakota about four years ago, before Standing Rock. This is a picture of what it is like to be, a, a, not just a native woman, this is white people took this picture up. 
you know, this is sex trafficking in the man camps. You know, so the economy that is predicated on the extraction, extreme extraction of the remaining resources that are out there is also predicated on this absolute destruction of humanity. You know, and we need to like not be justifying it. You know, and it's really, really important because that's like so, you know, and, and part of the challenge that we face is that, you know, I don't know if any of y'all came from North Dakota, but I live right next to North Dakota and most of my problems originate there. You know, even the pipeline that I'm facing now has to go through North Dakota, but my point is, is that a lot of people left North Dakota. I don't want to give you like the long speech on this, but these demographers called the, the poppers were up there in like the 1980s and they just marked how everybody left. You know, the average age of a farmer was like 60. Everybody moved, the next generation moved to like Seattle, Madison, Minneapolis, California. They left North Dakota. They left North Dakota is what they did. And when they left, when they left, they left a lot of their older relatives and the economy just like transitioned and they were, they, they, these, they were just like prey for the wind to come. And then around 2004, 2005, when we entered this era of extreme extraction, which is the era when you start to run out of fossil fuels and you come up with a whole bunch of bad ideas how to get your fix, they reopened the Bakken, right? They reopened the Bakken. And when you are fracking, you're at the bottom of the barrel. You understand what I'm saying? Because you're blowing up the bedrock of Mother Earth to get that last little bit out, you know? And so they went in there and they, and they, and they uh, rented, leased a lot of North Dakota is what they did. But when the poppers were up there, they had this great idea. Their idea was is that instead of continuing in this dysfunctional farm economy that is subsidized, you know, we should do something smart. And their idea was is that at one point in North Dakota and that whole territory that I refer to as the Northern Plains territory, the Northern Plains, I don't ever call it the Upper Midwest. I heard Patrick say that one more time today and I was like, no, you don't, Patrick. You know what I'm saying, like upper Midwest, what is that, the upper Midwest of what? You understand what I'm saying? That's like a nonsensical thing. <laughs> Sorry, you heard that, okay, you heard that this time. This guy said Great Lakes. Right, it's the Great Lakes, Great Lakes. He was trying to like, Great Lakes. I was like, no, it's, like, it's the Great Lakes, but this is the Northern Plains, anyway. So make a long story short. What they, you know, about 150 years ago, in the same territory where you see this now, there was 50 million buffalo. There was 50 million buffalo. 250 species of grass that supported those buffalo, tremendous agrobiodiversity and tremendous biodiversity. 50 million buffalo and a buffalo in the wintertime will walk right into a storm. A buffalo will walk right into a storm and a buffalo in the wintertime can just like with a little head like works like a corkscrew, goes like this and it'll still graze. It'll still graze. You think a cow could do any of that? No. A cow runs away. You know, that's why we lost 100,000 cattle in a freak snowstorm, 2013. Same thing a couple years before in, in Seattle. Because cattle can't survive in extreme temperatures. And so what do you think is going to survive during climate change, huh? So anyway, the poppers idea, they call it the Buffalo Commons. And what they said is you should pull them fences and return it to Buffalo. That's how you rebuild a sustainable economy in your region with a lot less misery. They were like all driven out of North Dakota as heretics, right? And then in 2000, they were invited back. They did that in 88. And in 2000, they were invited back and they were welcomed by the North Dakota Farm Bureau Association, who sponsored them. And I thought, that is so interesting. That was so interesting. But there was this moment when we could have done something, and instead the oil companies took over that state. But we have a little bit of, of responsibility for all of it. And I want to say this because y'all live in a cool place, like where you can like, get an electric car and go to the ferry and get on your electric bike and get on, you know what I'm saying? You did good here. But we all need you to move to Bismarck. <laughs> I'm just saying, because everybody, the cool people moved away. Y'all got that? And then the jerks moved in. And so then what happened in North Dakota is like that kept feeding it. And you got the man camps and you got this hatred and you got these like neo-Nazis buying small towns out there like the town. There's a movie called Welcome to Leith, which is about the small town the neo-Nazis got. Right? You know what I'm saying? You got all that stuff going on. You got increasing hatred. And then when, you, when, when you know, they throw this pipeline across, which they didn't have no regard for anybody. You know, that pipeline, their initial proposal was to put it north of the city of Bismarck, right? 95% white. Well, what they do? No, we don't want that. They put it north of, they put it north of Standing Rock, right? But that's how they treat native people out there, you know? And we call it the deep north. 
the deep north. That's what we refer to as North Dakota. Anybody who is out there knows why we call it the deep north, right? It's bitter. It's bitter, you know, but that's where I got organized. And so my point is, is that, you know, is that if people, you know, how you know things are dysfunctional is like all of that. And you know it's dysfunctional because I'll tell you another example of that is the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, right? Had one person that covered both North and South Dakota. So you let me know they got it, right? So my point is, is that we need to think about strategically what we're doing and everybody can't go hang out in one cool place and drink cool coffee and get on your electric bike. You understand what I'm saying, right? I'm saying, can y'all like help? You know, because it's like, you know, you let something like that fester and everybody just drives over North Dakota and says, hey, that's North Dakota. Too bad about North Dakota. And then something happens. You know, so that's, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. It's a little bit of our picture. So this is what came from me to, to North, you know, from North Dakota to me last time. There's a fracked oil pipeline here. It was known as a sandpiper. You know, you saw my, my territory and you saw those guys out on that lake. You know, my reservation has 500 bodies of water and 47 lakes. And one of those lakes is Big Rice Lake, called for a good reason. You know, it's all rice. It's a mother load of, of rice and it's all organic certified wild rice, you know, from our territory. And what happened is they announced a pipeline across our territory. And I, you know, I didn't really know much about pipelines. I'm actually not opposed to pipelines, like water and sewer. You know what I'm saying? And I like infrastructure that works. I signed up to live in like a first world country and stuff. Like you've got, if you've got a line in your city, it shouldn't blow up. But that's what happens, you know, because we've got aging infrastructure, right? And so what I want is a system that works. And I think we all want a system that works, right? Which is going to take a lot of work. But anyway, they announced this pipeline to go across our territory. And it's like, I have to study up all these pipelines. I was like so happy. I was being a happy corn farmer and protecting our wild rice from genetic engineering. And I was like, dang, yeah, you know, so I go educate myself and a lot of people probably heard this story, but I go try to, you know, it, you know, inform our community a lot and get our people thinking about it. And then we started standing up and then I went out and I started organizing. I decided I'm going to just try to write a bunch of articles and inform the neighbors who are all like Norwegian. And I was like, you know, and, that, and my theory was if you could get the Scandinavians mad, we'd be good, you know. <laughs> so they're all, you know, so we built a multiracial alliance is what we did. You know, and you guys have done a lot of that out here, built multiracial alliances. We all got to work together to defeat stupid projects. You know, that's what we got to do. And so we built one, you know, and it was, it was, it was a, good, a good alliance. And, and you know, for, for five years, I've given five years of my life to fight in Enbridge, and I ain't done yet. You know, we went to every regulatory hearing. You know, we went to every regulatory hearing and we prayed, we had our ceremonies, we rode our horses. You know, I dream we should ride our horses against the current of the oil. And uh, so we, we did that. We rode our horses and, you know, and then there was a lawsuit filed by Friends of the Headwaters which forced an EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, on the proposed 640,000 barrel per day pipeline that the state of Minnesota didn't think it had to do an EIS on, right? I was like, why doesn't the system work? You know what I'm saying? It's like, why would you not do an EIS on a 640,000 barrel a day pipeline? Court ordered, court ordered. They appealed it and then they were court ordered by the Minnesota Supreme Court. I was like, do your job, Minnesota, stand up for our, our lakes, you know? And so they, you know, they, they, we fought them and fought them and fought them. And uh, on August 2nd of, of uh, 2016, the Enbridge Corporation announced the cancellation of that pipeline. They canceled the pipeline. <laughs> so I, I tell you this story because, you know, our community defeat one pipeline. The problem is that we didn't defeat the system because the Enbridge Corporation then bought a third of the Dakota Access Pipeline and moved west. And so we followed them, as did a lot of people. You know, we followed them out there because we didn't think it was right for their people or our people. You know, and, and, uh, you know, and what we saw when we got out there, now I think we're going for the next slide, is this, and a lot of you saw this, you know. You know, this is what civil society should not look like. Next slide, this. And this is the problem that we have, and everybody knows we got this problem now. Because it was, you know, Obama quit, Trump reinstated it, but it existed for a long time, which is a surplusing of military equipment to civilian police forces, right? And so in this case, what you got here, I didn't even know what the thing was. It's this here is called an MRAP, Mine Resistant Armored Personnel Carrier. You know, I'm going to tell you what, this is Stetsman County's own Mine Resistant Armored Personnel Carrier. And Stetsman County has like about 5,000 people in it. And they, like, the biggest building is like a barn. You know, they certainly have no reason to have an MRAP. That's like to drive through the building, right? 
And that's what they got. And this one here on the, the other side is called an LRAD, long-range acoustic device intended to blow up your eardrums, right? You know, so our people had to like water protector it up because that's what we're facing. We're facing some brutal, brutal equipment. You know, and I'm proud to say that, you know, when we came back from Standing Rock, our family spent seven months out there. You know, and I was in and out of there. My horses were there. My sister was there. My family was out there most of the time. You know, we were at Red Warrior Camp. That's where we were with our horses. But, um, you know, my family took bullets and my family was arrested. I lost a horse out there. I was not. I was not arrested. You know, but we have a lot of PTSD from it. We have a lot of PTSD from it. But, you know, but, you know what, I, what I would say is that about a few months ago, I was sitting there mining my own beeswax. I was writing my little article, writing away on my kitchen table, like, you know, you think that in peace. I was like all happy. I had my little iPod on, you know, I was like jamming away. And I look up and my, and my grandsons are like, like, Granny, Granny. And I look out there and there's like these three little boys. And they're like, look, Granny, we're the water protectors. And I looked and one of them had my like dapple helmet on, which is a, which is a snowmobile helmet with a red sign on it, because you know, you don't want to get hit with a bullet in your head out there, right? So one had that on, and the other one had like a, a gas mask on, and then the third one had a bandana on. And they're like all 10 years old, and they all have like little like, you know, like, you know, Tupperware shields. <laughs> and they're like, look, Granny, we're the water protectors. And so what I'm saying is, is like, we're all water protectors. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that a whole generation of people was politicized because that's, like that's like a Selma moment. And we all saw that. We all witnessed it. You know, and we found ourselves, a lot of us found ourselves out there. I want to say that I'm really proud to have been out there and I was super proud and super relieved to see my grandsons and, and thought it was super funny that I have all that equipment in my house. <laughs> but I'm keeping it because I'm facing Enbridge's line three right now. And since Enbridge bought a third of that pipeline, we hold them responsible for a third of the injuries, a third of the arrests, a third of the tanks, a third of the bullets. And so when they came back at us with line three, which is the 915,000 barrel a day pipeline we are now facing, line three, single largest tar sands pipeline to cross the border. That's what we're facing, line three. We said we defeat you once and we're going to face you down again, Enbridge. We're going to face you down again. And so I'm saying that to y'all because if you didn't get a chance to get arrested at Standing Rock, Come see me in June. <laughs> you know, I'm hoping they don't issue that permit. I'm hoping they don't issue that permit because Minnesota is not North Dakota. And there was thousands of people from Minnesota that went to Standing Rock, and there are thousands of people in the North that do not want that pipeline. You know, so I feel like we got a decent shot. But all my grandsons have water protector outfits already. <laughs> they are prepared. They are prepared. Next picture, this here. You know, this is when civil society goes awry and the rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. And that's what has happened in this country. The rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. Next one. That's Desmond's County's MRAP. Next one. This is one of my prowess. This is a couple of my nephews. And uh, I tried to get them to teach me how to do that. I have not yet. <laughs> I was like, get me a really old horse. <laughs> I'll put that on my bucket list for 2018. <laughs> really, really old horse. But I rode with these guys last summer, and they're coming out to ride with me again. They plan to be out there on the line all summer with me. You know, I'm hanging out with you now, but come May, I'm going to be camping. Come May, we'll be camping, because we intend, you know, we do not know if they're going to issue that permit or not. State of Minnesota, the state of Minnesota uh, in uh, November, the Department of Commerce recommended against issuing the permit to the Enbridge Corporation, against it. But the final decision will be in June. You know, and we're praying, we're praying. But we expect that it may look like this. Next one. And this is a picture of my friend O'Shea. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, this is when we left, you know, and people were forced out. People were forced out. And forced out at gunpoint in the end. And they raised that whole camp. You know, both sacred stone, they just left nothing. You know, they left, well, they left one thing there, but this is when they left, and this is, our people set that fire. O'Shea and other people set that fire. I was sitting with LaDonna, LaDonna from Sacred Stone when that picture came out. I said, LaDonna, what you think? And she says, grief. That's our people's grief. And our, our people have done that before. When we are forced out of a place, we, we burn it so it will not be burned or touched by someone else. You know, and that's what these young men did. I was burning behind us. But there's this, you know, this whole school of, you know, one of my friends is studying fire 
And um, you know, they were talking about fire as like fire and how you, you know, how you light the fire, how you provide the kindling to the fire, and how you fuel the fire. And so they were talking about, you know, that's an image for a social movement too. You know, and everything that that crazy guy does in the, in, in the East fuels a social movement. Fuels a social movement. You know, and so take that fire and that power and understand that it is fueled by that. You know, when I think of Standing Rock, one of the things I think of is like, I had a lot of privilege in my life. But as a young woman, as a young woman, I, was, I got to sit with, uh, with Chief Frank Fools Crow and Chief Matthew King, Oglala Chiefs. And I remember, that, I remember that, that Matthew King said this one time, he said, the only thing sadder than an Indian who is not free is an Indian who doesn't remember what it is like to be free. And at Standing Rock, we all remembered what it was like. And that's what I mean, we did not forget anything. And so as we, as we move ahead as water protectors, we are emboldened by all our memories. Next picture. This is the last thing that is left, and this is a great, this is a, a uh, I met this guy, Charles Rencontre, down at the Institute for American Indian Arts. He says, well, no, and I got something to show you, and this is this giant statue. I said, that's cool, what's that statue? He says, there's an effigy pipe. An effigy pipe is like, you know, for our ceremonial pipes or for, you know, praying a pipe, but it had that little dude on it, you know, and he was on the pipe stem, and then there was a bowl in front of him that you put your tobacco on. Y'all kind of follow me on this? There's the pipe stem, and then there's the, you know, the bowl itself. So that was it. And the pipe is called, Not Afraid to Look at the White Man. <laughs> and that's that pipe, you know, and so he made that big. It's called, it's called Not Afraid to Look if you look up it online, but the full name is that. You know what I'm saying? is You cannot be afraid to look. And, you know, you all know what I'm talking about, because I'm not like, white is a social construct, right? You know, I'm sorry to inform you, you're not actually all white, you're like all different colors, right? But my point is, is that it's the construct. That's the Windigo economy construct, or the Wasichu economy construct. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And so not afraid to look. Do not be afraid to look. Do not be afraid to look. Next one. And this is uh, what we did in Bismarck. Oh, you can't probably see them, but we have put up all these big posters that were like, or these big billboards. I bought all these billboards that were like, love a water protector today. You know, because we want them to, you know, come to grips, you know, with the hatred and, and to begin to address the racism. Next one. Oh, and this is me at the Enbridge meeting last year. You know, we, you, you, sometimes you got to go right to the belly of the beast, right to the belly of the beast. And I say that because this is this moment, and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later, but I feel like it is clear that Trump has, you know, or in, the, in those the discussions yesterday, populism, I don't know if it's really populism, it's like fascism to me, but you know, that has, has taken the, the political system. The political system is not working for us right now, you know. There's a lot of challenge, you know, and of course I'm looking at the mid-year, you know, midterm elections, I'm looking at all that and how we need to get out and vote, but everybody here knows that, that voting is not enough. Got a lot of work. But you know, he may have taken the, the political system, but he didn't take the economic system. You know, he thinks he did with all this little fairy dust like he does this and that, you know, but he's like not that smart. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. <laughs> but my point is is that you gotta go face the monster. So I took a bunch of jingle dress dancers up there to the Exxon shareholders meeting last year and we were going back again. We're like, we're not afraid of you. We're not afraid of you and we're here. You know, and it was our women, you know, our women that were standing up there. Next one. So this is where we are, you know, and I, you know, everybody here knows this, we've consumed and during my lifetime, I'm almost 60, consumed half the world's known oil resources, had a blast doing it, y'all have fun? Come on, it was fun, right? <laughs> Just be honest, we had a blast, you know, it was a total blast. And what I want, which is what you want, is a graceful transition to the next economy, right? I'm like, I had enough, we're good, thank you, that was awesome, let's move on. Right, which is what you guys are starting on out here. And so it was like so encouraging to see all that cool electric stuff and walking and everything out here, you know? That's good. So we consume this, and so what happens is that what is left is, is really hard to get. You know, so there's a bunch of oil out there, but you know, it's like 20,000 feet under the ocean. So I was like really glad. What was that called a couple years ago where you stopped that shell rig? That shell rig was out here? With your kayaks, right? Right, the kayaktivism and like dance, you know, was, was it a shell? Yeah. It was a shell rig, right? I mean like that's like extreme extraction when you think you could go 20,000 feet under the ocean just because you can. Like my feeling is, is like, you know, it didn't work out with the deep water horizon. And the only people who should be 20,000 feet under the ocean are mermaids. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's like we don't have no business down there. That's not our part of the world. 
In our spiritual teachings as Anishinaabe, there's a lot of layers below us and above us, and we're only supposed to be on a couple of them. We're not supposed to be down there. You know, extreme extraction is when you try to stuff tar sands into a pipeline. Extreme extraction is when you blow off the top of 500 mountains in Appalachia. It's extreme behavior. It's like the behavior of a junkie, right? And that's where we're at. We're in a junkie system, in a junkie system. And so for us, it is incumbent upon us to deal with our addictions. You know, cut our levels of consumption. Cut our levels of consumption and be smart. Next one here. So this is what I refer to as the sitting bull plan. Now I say that because like Trump has a plan, but it is not a good one. And this great chief sitting bull, he said, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And that's really this moment. Because you know, everybody has different gifts, you know? Some people are really good at technology. You know what I'm saying? It's like we got different gifts. We all got different gifts. And now is the time to put our minds together because the 1% ain't gonna solve this one, <laughs> right? And Trump sure ain't, you know? So I refer to this as the sitting bull plan. Next one. So this is part of it. This is the next economy. I've shown some of these slides before, but this is some work we did about five years ago down there at, at Diné College. So some solar we put on the Diné College Library when they put that up, and that was, we used some, uh, there was some set-asides that were put in an escrow account from the, the SO2 uh, from Southern California Edison when it decided to not add more to climate change, and they decided to start cutting their fossil fuel consumption. Southern California Edison, right? California utilities decided to go more towards renewables and clean up their acts. So they closed the Mojave Generating Station. They had this pile of money. And we started leveraging it. So this is one of our projects that we worked on, you know, which is solar for Navajo. And everybody here knows that like that is, you know, there's a lot of pieces like that. Next one here. Oh, this is, this is uh, last week at the Capitol in Minnesota. This is the next economy too. This is my really cool bus. See this? Burning Man donated this bus to us. Y'all know Burning Man? Yeah, so this is the biodiesel solar bus of the Stop Line 3 campaign. And um, this was at the state capitol. This is like also what the next economy looks like. I got this vet driving it who like drove bombs around in Iraq. He's like really good. I figure you can drive the bus. <laughs> you know, we have so many veterans in this country. And the Native community has so many veterans. It's like the next economy, you'll be at the front driving those things like that. You know, doing like all kinds of cool stuff. So he's like super proud. His name is Andrew. Next one. This is what the next economy looks like. This is a, a woman, um, her name is Melina Lubicon, and she's from the middle of what's known as the Tar Sands, Lubicon Cree woman. And um, so her master's thesis at the University of Victoria, I met a young woman going to the University of Victoria. Her master's thesis, I was on her committee, and her master's thesis was to, um, help her village. Her village had a uh, solar, ha had, a, had a health center in it that was, had a diesel generator that powered it. And I just want to say, like, in Canada, the North is third world. You know, you got these people that are totally laid to waste by big energy projects with diesel generators and no electricity in their villages. You know, that is the reality. You know, I lived up there in the North. I, I, I was married in my, and up in Moose Factory, Northern Ontario, and I saw big damn projects and people with diesel generators. That's, you know, that's what racism looks like in Canada, and it's prolific. So she decided for her master's thesis that she would, she didn't like just talk about the solar project, she installed the solar project for her master's thesis. So this is her 20 kilowatts of solar, and she did. And I was like super proud to know her, and super proud to be her advisor. But I point that out to you because a lot of you are students. You know, do something with what you got. Do something with what you got, it's your moment. You know, I mean, we're privileged, we're first world people, no matter where we come from, we're still, we're, you know, you're at this university, or you're in a master's program, you're in a PhD program, or you're an undergraduate, you know, a lot of people don't have the privilege y'all have. Take your, take your knowledge and do something with it, like, put up, you know. And so she inspired me, so uh, I put up 20 kilowatts of solar too, this, I don't think if it's in the next picture, I forgot, but I did it, you know, but I'm not as cool as her, but we did 20 kilowatts in my book. <laughs> next one. So this is what we think the next economy should look like. So this, this is the Leech Lake Reservation and it's crossed by six Enbridge pipelines right now. And those pipelines are all 50 years old and they're all leaking and Enbridge wants to start abandoning them. First one is line three, they want to abandon an old pipeline which is like a really bad precedent, right? You know, I raise a lot of kids and I always say, you know, you got to clean up your old mess before you make a new mess. 
Right? Amber just wants to walk away and make a new pipeline, make a whole new corridor. So I said, this is their idea of what the future looks like, which is a bunch of microgrids and a bunch of solar in their villages. You know, and to me, in, in northern Minnesota, we, like, it, we, we have vision. So my point is, is that everyone in here, just me, you know, like what I think about is like, don't just say what's wrong. Articulate what's right. You know, ji misa waban daming, ji misa waban daming. That's the word in our language, which means like, that the translation is positive window shopping for your future. <laughs> right? Where are you going? What's it going to be like 25 from years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Who's in charge of that? You know, who's going to be in charge of that? You're going to, you're going to you know, wait for somebody else to figure that out for you? You're not going to like how it looks. You're not going to like how it looks. So be proactive and go. Next one. That's just a cool buffalo. Next one. <laughs> this is what I do. A lot of people like know this about us, but that's what I prefer to do is grow these cool corn varieties. And I grow those corn varieties because they're twice the protein and half the calories of market varieties. And also because uh, when you grow them, they kind of short like this. When I first grew them, I thought it kind of failed. My father he came to see me when I was at Harvard and he, you know, he said, Winona, you're a smart young woman but I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> and so, you know, I try to grow corn. The first time I grow, it's like this tall, and I'm like, man, I didn't do very good. Huh? But then I noticed it put on an ear. All I had to do was put on an ear, right? And so uh, that's what I grow. This year, never had a, I never had a uh, crop failure. It's frost resistant, you know, it's uh, drought resistant. And when the big winds came through, they blew down the tall Monsanto Roundup Ready varieties, but mine stood. So that was my point. When you grow the next economy, you got to grow the next economy, and it's going to be a lot of local food, so you aren't transporting stuff around. You guys got it all set up out here, but I'm saying North Dakota could use some help. You already heard that, right? And we're going to need some more help, too. Next one. This is my sustainable economy at White Earth. This is uh, Big Rice Lake, facing the pipeline. And I've told Enbridge many times, you do not want to, bring, you do not want to try that, because my people are very angry. They're very angry. And when, you know, we have fought for our rice. We have defeated everybody who has come after our rice for the last 10,000 years. You know, and so we are, we are prepared for you. Next one. Oh, this is like if you're feeling like you can't do anything, try these guys. Yellowknife Garden Produce. They don't even have topsoil. They don't even have topsoil. And so they like, have all these grow beds. You know what I'm talking about? It's grow beds and they like, have to make compost to make their little topsoil up there. And then I go up there to see my friend Lona Sorensen, and she's using caribou hair in their compost, right? Because I got a lot of caribou hair, and it has like all this nitrogen and calcium in it. So it's like if you can grow in caribou hair, everybody could grow, right? Like, don't be a slacker. Next one. <laughs> Next one. My friend Will Allen, I don't know why he got so fuzzy. Growing power, growing power out of Mount Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Three acres, million pounds of food. Indoor greenhouses, urban agriculture. You know, to reduce the petroleum economy, we've got to quit moving food around, right? We've got to quit moving stuff around. We've got to quit moving junk around. We've got to quit importing junk from China. Everybody's crying around about the solar panels, you know, and saying that we don't like that. I don't like that either. Of course, I don't like the tariff on the solar panels, but it's like, why the hell aren't we making our own solar panels? You understand what I'm saying? Like, globalization is predicated on access to cheap oil. If you don't have cheap oil, globalization doesn't work out so well. You know, and we have an, an entire rust belt of stilled, you know, just stilled manufacturing in this country. We don't even make anything in this country. We just consume and shop. Make our own solar panels and grow our own food. Next one. Ah, the hemp one. And I must report, I'm totally not stoned, although I look stoned in this picture. <laughs> I was like, I saw that picture, but this is my tribal hemp field. Is that cool or what? Well, my reservation, the White Earth Reservation, and thank you all for moving things forward. You know, my, my reservation, uh, you know, put this, uh, grew this hemp out. And um, so what I'm interested in, as these young people told you, is the fiber economy. You know, I'll probably do some CBDs for my, my village. You know, because everybody needs the CBDs for fibromyalgia and everything else, right? It's like, you know, rock star. The, the plant is medicine. Plant's an adaptogen. 
But the fact is, is that we don't even, like everything I'm wearing is like toxic. You know, cotton, like, you know, 5,000 gallons to produce a t-shirt and pants of water, right? 85% of the, you know, fiber that's out there that's used in textiles is cotton. And most of it's super toxic, grown with all kinds of pesticides, laying to waste vast areas of land everywhere. Now it turns out Minnesota, turns out Minnesota used to grow all our own clothes until about the 1930s. About the 1920s is when it started decreasing, but in 1940, there was 11 hemp mills in Minnesota. We grew our clothes. That's what I want back. And that's one of the hardest things. Of course, I have to pick the hard things, but you know, that's what I want back. I want the hemp economy. And, and why do I want that? Because of all those reasons about the clothes. And you know what, this country, in the, between 1980 and 1990, I think it was 95% of our mills were stilled. In the Carolinas, all those mills closed down in the Carolinas and Georgia, and where'd they all go? China. Any piece of fabric you buy in this country today usually comes from China or India. And when that all happened, you know, everybody thought that was like really cool, but you know, you just look down there in Georgia and North Carolinas, you know what you got that basically replaced it? A prison economy. That's what happened. So which is better? You know, so what we need to do is we need to rebuild an economy where you build, grow things and use things that are local. That's how you reduce your fossil fuels economy. Next couple slides. This is wind. This is the first offshore wind project. This is in Massachusetts. Next one. This is the future of wind. You guys need to get out there with, even the crows are talking about wind now, and they have four coal generators. Aren't you guys all laughing? Like, the last people to talk about wind would be the crows, right? But look, like look at how much wind there is in Montana. BPA should be buying wind, you know? I don't know why Indian reservations are the windiest place in the country. Go figure, but look at that. White Earth's up there, class four wind. I'm, on a, I'm trying to, my goal is to figure out how to wind power a, a mill, you know? I'm not smart enough to figure it out, but I know it's possible. Next one. Canada, wind. Next one. People say you can't make the next economy out of, out of renewables because you can't meet present demand. I say, why would you want to meet present demand if you waste 57% of your power between point of origin and point of consumption? That's what I mean. You need to change that. Next one. You need to reduce your materials economy. You know, the story of stuff told, taught us that. You need to quit buying junk. You need to build an economy which is cyclical. Next one. Now, if you think those guys are so smart in the oil industry, look at this. Between 2011 and 2016, the three big guys, Exxon Chevron and ConocoPhillips, this is their net income. It went from 80.4 billion in net income down to 3.7 billion in net income between 2011 and 2016. Exxon itself went from 40.1 billion in net income down to 2.8 billion in net income in those five years. That's quite a loss of net income for a corporation, right? Now, my point of this is that if you were the CEO of Exxon, do you think you'd still have your job? <laughs> no, <laughs> because why? Because you would have, you're Rex Tillerson and you would have been appointed to Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is that they ain't as smart as they act like they are. And that's like Trump economics right there. So you go out there and say to everybody, we're gonna eliminate fuel efficiency. And so who the hell wants a car that goes eight miles a gallon, buddy? And so what did California say when Trump said that? They said, no, we're just going to keep it the way we are. And California's the 14th largest economy in the world. So who do you think in the end is going to win that one? I bet you California's going to win that one. You understand what I'm saying? Like every time Trump says something, I was just down in California, I was like, you keep it up, California. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm going to close down cannabis and hemp. I'm saying, you try to deal with California and Colorado, Washington and Oregon on that one. I think that train left the station sessions. Right? You understand what I'm saying? So I'm saying they took the political system, but it is our opportunity to make the next economy. That's our opportunity and our responsibility. And it's a lot of entrepreneurs out here. Next one. This is the memo they missed about the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. Next one. Divestment, huge movement. Huge movement in this country. Keep it up. Keep it up. You know, I, like I said, I was just up in Canada in the Calgary Herald. I talked to all these reporters up there and they're like, they are sweating. They are sweating in Calgary. They're sweating over the divestment and they're sweating because they don't have a pipeline yet. Next one. This is my village. 
My village is called Pine Point, middle of the White Earth Reservation, and this is a snapshot. There was a film that was called The Seventh Fire. It was like a total misuse of the, of the name, but it kind of called that poverty porn, when you like take a snapshot of a village in a meth epidemic and make a documentary about it and go to a bunch of festivals. It's the truth. It's like my village has a meth epidemic. Now we have an opioid epidemic and we have a heroin epidemic. That's my village. You know, I'm privileged, I'm standing here in front of you, but you know, people know me and know my family and know the village that we live in. It's rough, it's rough. You know, I don't, I don't work in an easy place. I don't work in an easy place, but I will tell you that my people are tough and they, they are racers, that's the one thing we got. And they like have very, you know, they're, they're like about this far, you know, they're like very close to the edge. You know, they're very upset with Enbridge. This is my village, and then we didn't like how that looked, and so we decided to change it up. This is what we started doing under the theory that if you make, make it beautiful, you will feel better. My daughter calls these the mean girls. <laughs> but this is what we did, is we started taking these tagged out houses and painting them, next picture. Put some solar panels on our houses, solar thermal. So we're building a solar thermal manufacturing plant in my village. And we're doing that because um, in, in Minnesota, where I live, it's really cold, but it's really sunny. And so you can reduce 20 to 25% of your heating bill, and why wouldn't you want to do that? So that's what we're doing, and we're building them ourselves right there in our village. And we're installing them. This is just the house of the sun. One of my sons there on the left. Next picture. Nice, huh? Next one. That's my grandsons. The horse riders. The water protectors with the helmets, that's them. That's us riding the line last year, riding the proposed pipeline route. Next one. This is a beautiful water protector woman. I just want to say, like, basically, we are way cooler than them. I just want to say that, you know? And I know that, because like, we had this showing of our film, First Daughter and the Black Snake, University of Wisconsin Superior, and Enbridge asked the university if they could have equal time at our event. I was like, throw your own event, buddy. <laughs> I was like, you don't have a cool movie? You don't have a cool story? No one wants to come to your events? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You have to pay people to go show up at hearings for you? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm saying, like, be cool, because we are. Be beautiful, be magical. You know, that's who we are. Next one here. Pray. This is that good, cool guy in Modo. I forget his name, Masuro Moto, the cool, the cool Japanese guy. He takes a picture of like before and after prayer. Your water. Pray to your water. Pray to your water. Believe in the power of your spirit because they, you know, a corporation is not a person. Although they say it is under the law because a corporation does not have a soul. A person has a soul. And your soul and your spirit is who makes change. Next one. That's another one. Water before and after prayer. These are like some, you know, some places that are contaminated. Got to believe in yourself. Got to believe in change. Believe in the power. Next one. You know, instead of the rights of corporations, we need to people, the people who recognize the rights of nature. And the first country that did this, Bolivia. Rights of nature enshrined in the Constitution by the first indigenous president in the Western Hemisphere, Evo Morales. Hugo Chavez, also an indigenous president. Rest in peace, Hugo. But what I'm saying is, it's like, you know, that is where we need to go. The changes that we need to make are, you know, like I said, a lot of them are economic. A lot of them are economic. A lot of them are how we think. A lot of them are in legal institutions. And, you know, we can say that a lot of changes will be made, you know, in different ways. I think that my best teachers in this moment are really the Zapatistas. You know? And I say that because they, they, they face a brutal situation, but they organize in the places where neoliberalism is not. And there's no neoliberalism in North Dakota. Did I ever say that? <laughs> no, but my point is that, is take the space. Take the space. Don't be fearful. You know, act, act, out, of the, act out of your power. And like, to be honest with you, we all talk about it. I see it on Facebook all the time. We talk about the 99% and the 1%. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that a lot of the 1% live here in Seattle, I got that. But you understand what I'm saying is like, we always talk about we're the 99% and the 1% do all this stuff to us, right? And I feel like if we're the 99%, why don't we act like it? You understand what I'm saying? It's like, let's act like the 99%. Let's make the changes that need to be made instead of, you know, I mean, even a lot of the 1% don't like Trump. 
right? On climate change, a lot of those major CEOs, they were like, no, we support, you know, we support the Paris Accords, right? Remember that? And then on the tax cuts, like 400 billionaires and millionaires like wrote into members of Congress and said, don't pass it. The disparity of wealth is already disgraceful. So I'm just saying keep pushing where the 99% act like it. Next one. Rights of rivers. This is the uh, rights of the Wanganui River in, in um, New Zealand. Same thing. You know, the rights of nature, rights of rivers. Next one. Our water protector woman. I just want to say in closing, you know, I, I think about our moment now and I'm, I'm reminded of, um, you know, my privilege. You know, I know a lot of people, get to go a lot of places. And uh, I was sitting home one day and I was reading the annual report of these guys, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation from Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. I'm reading their annual report. And I look up there and they say, uh, and I find this quote in the report. And I was like, oh, I got to borrow this quote. So there's my academic sourcing. It came from the end report of the Thunder Valley. But anyway, I call Nick Tilson. I said, Nick, one of my nephews, he says, um, he, says, he says, auntie, auntie, I'm going to tell you, you can use the quote, but I got to tell you where the quote came from. I says, okay. He says, this is, the, this is where it came from. He said, we, being a bunch of Oglala men, we're going into Sweat Lodge down outside of Porcupine, I believe is where it was, on, 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 on the um, Pine Ridge Reservation. He said, we were going to the sweat lodge, and he was getting ready to go in, and we, and, uh, you know, he said we were talking smack. Basically, we was talking like the tribal council did this, this person did that, and I don't like what that person did, you know. And I say that because everybody in here knows, like, like native people are super sacred, but we talk smack, and smack all the time, right? <laughs> so, you know, so they were doing that talking smack thing, and then they go into the lodge and try to, like, get all straightened out before they go to pray. <laughs> I've done that, too, so I'm like... Anyway, so they go in there, and they said they're in the lodge, and, they said, and, and then he said the spirit came into the lodge. That's what he told me. And this is the quote, and it's from the spirit. He said this is what those spirits said to them. The spirit said, how long are you going to let others determine the future for your children? Are we not warriors? When our ancestors went into battle, they did not know what the consequences were going to be. All they knew is that if they did nothing, things would not go well for their children. Do not operate out of a place of fear. Operate out of a place of hope. Because with hope, everything is possible. The time is now, and the movement is here. Miigwech, thank you for your time.